Back to the past. Samurai Jack. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Graphic Content. I am your host, Ted Kendrick, and today I'm going to be talking to you about Ronin. It was a six issue miniseries written by Frank Miller, written and drawn by Frank Miller, as he is known to do from time to time. Now, this book was published by DC Comics in 1983. It's Frank Miller's first creator owned material. Um, you'd know him from later works such as 300 and Sin City, but this book was published shortly after Miller had left Marvel Comics doing a legendary run on Daredevil, but before he had ever uh, done any of his Batman books. Later, the late 1980s would be known for uh, The Dark Knight Returns, which has become a classic seminal story about the later days of Bruce Wayne, as well as Batman Year One, which is a classic seminal story about the early days of Bruce Wayne. So he's done both uh, ends of the spectrum and has since uh, written the character some more in sequels. Um, the Dark Knight Strikes Again, Frank Miller did all the artwork for that book as well, and The Dark Knight Three, The Master Race, which um, he had help with Andy Cooper on the artwork, but Frank Miller did the occasional Occasional sort of tie-in comic that was within the comics as a little uh, sort of mini stories every now and then. Frank Miller does a lot of his own artwork and I think uh, Ronin is the perfect example of when a writer knows exactly what he's writing for. Uh, you know when you're doing your own artwork you don't have to have any sort of guesswork there. You don't have to write the Marvel way. Basically you give the artist the page subjects and you wait for them to draw the art before you do any of the dialogue. He's not doing that. He knows being the artist himself exactly what he's looking for from the beginning. I had a publisher give me um, free reign creatively. I was able to work in collaboration with Lynn Varley, the painter who was able to bring um, unheard of dimension to the color art. I was able to charge into this form, into this into this project with, with, with this art form that's been in suspended animation for so damn long that, that most people don't think it, it has a, um, that it could possibly be any good. And I was able to play with it. I was able to, to uh, twist things around to to bring in um, subjects and themes and and graphic methods from from sources far flung on top of that I was able to I was I uh, had been exposed to what was going on in Japan in the comic books and in France and these these uh, the the work of Mobius in France and the work of um, Gosuke Kojima in in Japan um, both of these collided on me at roughly the same time and came right out in Ronin. It was a playground and it was a nightmare and it was, it was a wonderful project to work on. Nothing could have taught me more. Nothing could have made me feel better about the form or make me feel more committed about this as, the, as, the, as my art form than Ronin. There's a lot of amazing set pieces in here. Um, being set in the, the near future, we get to see a version of New York City that is really grungy in the same sort of ways that Gotham City is depicted in The Dark Knight Returns. People live in the gutter, and we're told that this is supposed to be sort of an all-out utopia for the world, at least the scientists who are involved in the Aquarius Project, which is, you know, your typical shady sci-fi operation going on in the middle of the city. They're basically living in this self-sustaining environment that is being controlled by an AI called Virgo. Now Virgo has a very maternal instincts to her. She's got a creative personality. So she's not just a robot, not just an AI, but basically a living organism. Um, she's able to self-replicate. Uh, near the beginning of the series, the whole laboratory blows up in this explosion, but not a chapter later, she's rebuilding totally fine and actually taking over more uh, landmass of New York in the process. So all the scientists who work in the Aquarius Project work inside Virgo. Their operations lab is part of this living sentient computer. So they're always able to stay in constant communication with this AI. Another aspect of this computer's um, functionality involves this guy named Billy. Now Billy was born with no arms and no legs. He was also gifted with heightened telepathy. So he's able to control things with his thoughts to the point where he's able to manipulate people's behaviors. So the plot really starts to come to a head when Billy gets visited by the spirit of the Ronin. Now back in uh, 13th century Japan, we see these dreams that Billy starts to, to play out with and he's not really sure if it's reality, something he's heard in the story, but nevertheless 
Billy is actively seeing these memories from this 13th century Ronin figure. His master was killed by this demon called a Gat, and I wouldn't be doing my uh, my homework or my job if I didn't tell you that this book greatly influenced Samurai Jack, the cartoon on Cartoon Network. So you can visualize the Ronin as Jack, and the demon a Gat is very similar to Aku, to the point where they even have really similar sort of spiky headpieces. The demon kills the Ronin's master, sends him on this path of being a Ronin, and then years later, now, the master, okay, before I, years later, <laughs> the master had in his possession the blood sword, and it's the only item out there that's uh, capable of killing the demon it got. The sword gets its power from all the blood that it draws in its victim, it charges the sword up, and then it takes the blood of an innocent to actually deliver the piercing killing blow for a demon. The Ronin goes out, gets this sword all powered up, he's ready to deliver the killing blow to Agat, prepares to do the, the samurai suicide move where he stabs his stomach, twists, gets both of them in the process. So he himself serves as the innocent blood for the blood sword, and as he and Agat are both pierced together, Agat does one last curse and binds the two of them to the sword, where um, 800 years later in the 21st century, they're both reincarnated and brought back to the world. That's where the story really starts, and Billy, this telepath, his uh, body and the spirit of the Ronin come together as one after the sword is uncovered and the spirits of the Ronin and the God are unleashed back into the world. As Billy becomes the Ronin, he is the one responsible for creating the psychic backlash that destroys Project Aquarius. And so when that happens, having no arms and legs, he's actually morphed into part of the building, which grows cybernetic arms and legs for Billy, and his consciousness is overridden by the Ronin. So scared, alone, he runs out into the city, he's got these robot limbs, realizes his power as a Ronin and his prowess with a sword, um, has a couple of encounters with people from Project Aquarius who are trying to bring him back, ends up with him killing a few of the men, and this is truly the first comic I think I've reviewed here on graphic content that might actually deserve the warning label graphic content. Some of the battle scenes depicted by Frank Miller in this series are gruesome and bloody. Beautiful artwork, and Frank Miller does a great job with these scenes, but they are definitely not for, uh, you know, light-stomached readers. <laughs> I don't want to give everything away with the end of the story, but I'll say there's so many layers going on in terms of who we want to root for, who we want to win in this adventure. So while um, our hearts are with Billy and the Ronin and want him to succeed in defeating the demon, we're also really interested in Casey, who's um, a black woman who works for Project Aquarius, and she had a very close relationship Relationship with Billy, he wants to return him to the facility, but as the Ronin, if he's possessed or whatnot, he still killed multiple men in her security unit. So she is very concerned about that and wants justice for, for these murders as well. As the story goes on, she starts to fall in love with the Ronin despite her better intuitions, you know, because like I said, this guy killed some of her men. We learn, or at least we're forced to sort of consider the idea that Billy is making all of this Ronin stuff up. That it never happened uh, even in the 13th century. The demon doesn't exist and all of this is fabricated from Billy to tell to the computer in a way to sort of act up and get what he wants because as a person born with no limbs he only lives in his head and his imagination. We start to have these layers of is the Ronin real? Is Billy evil and psychically manipulating all the events going on in the city? What's the agenda behind the computer? And the person who's basically using this organic almost like nano technology sort of te uh, stuff to you know that's basically um I'm saying a mouthful of words right now. <laughs> for the longest time, people wanted to harness that tech and not let it fall in the wrong hands, but as the company is taken over by someone who's interested in making this weaponized, it's really only up to the Ronin to bring this down and not let that uh, dark future get realized. So we have so many different angles on who we want to root for, who is in the right here. By the end of the book, I don't know if, if everything's justified, but it feels like a solid end that um, sets the world right on a path of justice once again. This is um, basically my review of Ronin. I had fell in love with it, read it really fast. Um, it's a great read if, you know, rainy day and you're stuck inside. Nothing to do. I think it would make a great movie. I hope one day it's adapted into something that deserves a, a big action budget that could do all the sort of special effects and choreography that's needed for a story like this. Maybe even Frank Miller will direct it. He's done movies before. He directed The Spirit with Samuel Jackson and Scarlett Johansson. Not a great movie, 
but you know, <laughs> it's out there. It's a thing you can watch. Definitely recommend that you check this book out. I borrowed this from a friend, but I'm sure, you know, it's nearly 30 years old. It is more than 30 years old. You can find a copy pretty easily. Yeah. Thanks for watching another episode of graphic content and uh, feel free to explore the rest of the Watchtower database. Uh, we have multiple shows going on. I'm part of the 12th level intellects, which is a podcast. Uh, it's bi-weekly, just like this show that comes out every other Monday. This show comes out every other Wednesday. We've also got Maddie Washburn's The Vanishing Point every other Thursday, as well as our Sunday video essay series, which you never really know what you're going to get with that. Um, I'm also the lead writer on Legacies of the DC Animated Universe, and we've got a special issue set on June 21st, 2019. It's going to lead up to the events of Batman Beyond Rebirth Part 1 from the opening episode, so I hope you check it out and let me know what you think of that. I really enjoyed writing it. Um, I'm going to hop off now. I think I've said enough, so thanks for <coughs> thanks again for watching. It's been another episode of Graphic Content, and I'm Tech Kendrick. I'll see you again in two weeks. Thank <laughs> you.